stressed uh, wired on wireless networks, uh, per pervasive and ubiquitous computing. And he'll be talking to us about some work he's done at Google to try and um, scale and host based rate limiters to thousands of uh, flows and policies. Uh, thank you, Sayo, for the introduction. Today I'm going to present to you our, uh, our work with, in collaboration with my colleagues at Google, Nandita, Terry, Vallas, uh, Carlo, and Amin. And this work was made possible through the support of my advisors, Ellen Zagura and Mustafa Moor. So uh, this is the customary picture of uh, Google Data Center. Operating this, a network at this scale is introducing uh, new requirements for traffic shapers. For instance, rate limiting and isolation between millions of flows, thousands per machine, is, is, is now a requirement. Also, new protocols that require per flow pacing, meaning inserting gaps between packets, is also becoming a requirement like for something like TCP BBR or Timely. Using those uh, uh, requirements or uh, uh, complying with those requirements actually is putting unprecedented uh, overhead on traffic shapers in terms of number of flows and number of packets. So let's take a look at the architecture of traffic shapers. Packets included in the traffic shaper are first classified based on their class and configured rate. Then they are enqueued in uh, packets belonging to the same class are enqueued in the same queue. Then a scheduler needs uh, to uh, look at the queues and, and, and dequeue packets from them in order, either using timers or busy polling. So this architecture works fine if you have a small number of configured rates three like in this picture. But as you start to scale to tens of thousands of configured rates, you start running into problems. For instance, the classifier has to look now at, uh, uh, at, at tens of thousands of configured rates. Then we need uh, a data structure that can manage tens of thousands of queues. Then finally, we need a scheduler that can index and dequeue in order from tens of thousands of queues as well. So looking at this architecture, our conclusion was we need a new generation of traffic shapers that can handle tens of thousands and potentially millions of flows and configured rates. And our main idea is very simple. Let's replace this uh, architecture of many queues with a single low overhead queue. So our contributions in this paper are, like, uh, are as follows. First, we quantify the overhead of current shapers. Then we introduced three core design principles for the next generation of shapers. The first uh, design principle is replacing this complex architecture with a single very low overhead queue. Then we avoid the per packet synchronization that's currently present in the kernel uh, by isolating uh, the time stampers uh, from, uh, the, uh, 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 from the uh, shaper and uh, running shapers in per core silos. Finally, you allow the shaper to reduce the overhead uh, uh, of uh, the number of packets enqueued in it by allowing it to apply back pressure to the sender. So in this talk, I'm going uh, to first tell you about the overhead of current shapers. Then I'm going to give you an overall, uh, overall view of uh, our system carousel. Then I'm going to talk about our first two core uh, design principles. You can look at the paper for the third one. So to look at problems with current traffic shapers, we looked at uh, the popular ones currently used in the kernel uh, in, in, in QDisk or queuing disciplines. So we looked at HTB, hierarchical token bucket, and FQ pacing, and we found problems in both. In this talk, I'm just going to focus on FQ pacing. So FQ pacing is the kernel queuing discipline that's responsible for per packet pacing in t for TCP flows. And as you can see from this picture, it's very complex. It, uh, it relies on a hash map of red-black trees for efficient uh, uh, per-packet lookup or flow lookup. It also keeps an ordered list of all flows based on their next transmission time to efficiently uh, look at the next packet to transmit. This introduces a, lo a log n overhead per-packet, where n is the number of flows, to, uh, 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 to keep this sorted list of flows. So we quantified the overhead of this, uh, uh, of this uh, QDisk uh, by running it on production machines and comparing it to uh, a FIFO uh, uh, QDisk. We, co we compared them in terms of overall CPU utilization. Uh, and we found that 
the uh, the Q, uh, the, uh, the FQ introduces 10% more overhead in the overall CPU utilization, meaning that for a 72 core machine, FQ utilizes seven cores. So this this sort of motivated us to think about overhauling the whole uh, shaping architecture. So I'll, I'll give you first sort of a life of a packet in, in Carousel. So Carousel relies on time stamping packets based on the rate. So packets trans transmitted from the transport are first time stamped based on their transmission rate. Then Carousel relies on a single queue where all packets from all flows are time indexed and sorted based on their time index. And then, uh, uh, and then based on their time, uh, time stamp, packets are dequeued. So Carousel requires fine-grained timers or busy pulling. And in, in our implementation, we use busy pulling, although that's not a design requirement. And also, for, for, to avoid uh, synchronization problems, we, we pin Carousel to a single core. You can have multiple instances for scalability, but each of them has to be pinned to a single core. So our first design principle is single queue shaping. And as I, as I just uh, told you, it's, uh, it relies on having all packets from all traffic in a single queue. This means that we need a data structure that can handle tens of thousands, up to hundreds of thousands, even millions of packets in queued in them, and then be able to dequeue and in queue packets at line rate. So to achieve this, we do, two, we, we do two things. First, we rely on the timing wheel for, uh, as a data structure, and we separate the time stampers from the architecture of the, uh, of the shaper. So the timing wheel is a data, uh, data structure introduced by George Verghese in 87. It takes a bucket sort approach to calendar queue, which is a time indexing data structure. Uh, it relies on, in, in our case, we rely that on having a minimum configurable rate, thus, thus allowing us to have a, a maximum time, uh, uh, time in the future where we can schedule a packet to set this time horizon. And then each bucket in this bucket list represents a time interval in, the, in, the, in that horizon. We benchmarked the timing wheel, and we found that regardless of the number of packets uh, enqueued in the timing wheel, the overhead per packet is 21 to 22 nanoseconds, meaning that it can support up to 500 gigabits per second for 1,500 uh, byte uh, uh, packets. The second component of our single queue shaping is the time stampers. And time stampers are basically policy-based. So for instance, in, uh, if you're dealing with TCP pacing, then we allow the t TCP itself to annotate the packet with its pacing rate, a timestamp based on the pacing rate. And if we're doing uh, aggregate rate limiting, like with bandwidth allocation, uh, like network-wide bandwidth allocation, we allow the bandwidth enforcer or the bandwidth allocator to also annotate the packet with its timestamp. All, uh, the carousel then picks the largest timestamp because that corresponds to the most stringent policy. And the calculation of uh, the, the timestamp is very simple. It's based on the last issued timestamp, configured rate, and the size of the packet. So the whole operation of a single queue shaper looks something like this. If we have two flows, one uh, configured to one packet per second, the other is configured to half a packet per second, and we have a timing wheel with buckets each, correspond each representing one second interval. Packets coming in are time stamped, and then uh, they're enqueued in their corresponding uh, location in the timing wheel from, from both flows. Assuming that for the first time step, just for this example, all packets come in, and then they're dequeued at further time steps. So as you can see, packets are enqueued in their location. And then for the second time step, the timing wheel spins and dequeues the first set of packets. And then for the second time step, the timing wheel spins again and dequeues the second set of packets. Within a, it's important to know, that, to know that within a bucket, all packets are treated 5 -4. So we lose a little bit of accuracy, but in our experiments, we found that actually our adherence to target rates is better. You can check the paper for that. So the second design, uh, the second design core principle is apply, allowing that shaper to apply back pressure to the sender uh, using deferred completion. So before I explain how we do that, I'll, I'll explain first the value of back pressure, then I'll explain what we mean, what, what, how the completion signal works, and then I'll show you how we combine both. So consider a, a shaper that works without back pressure. In that case, the, the sender will blast the shaper with window worth of packets. 
This can cause several problems. For instance, it can, it can overwhelm the memory allocated for the shaper, hence in, uh, introducing unnecessary drops, like tail, uh, tail drops. The other problem is it can introduce head of line blocking because some mice flows might take, some elephant flows might take all the memory and then everything else, everything else will be blocked. So we, we allow the shaper to control the rate of packets in queue to it for every uh, flow, thus reducing the memory, alloc uh, thus reducing the memory allocated for, uh, for each flow in the shaper. So to do that, we use the completion signals. The completion signal is the signal from the NIC to the network stack that tells the network stack to do the housekeeping uh, 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 related to that packet. Uh, so once the packet is transmitted, a completion signal is delivered to the network stack. In current network stacks, completions are typically delivered in order. And even worse, if you're in a virtualized setting, the, even though the hypervisor might be the one doing uh, all the shaping, the virtual NIC is the one that delivers the completion to the, uh, to the, to the, net, to the guest stack. Uh, thus, we don't have any control over it. So our, our design choice was to allow the shaper, regardless of where it is in the stack, to, co to control the delivery of the completion signal. And for that also, we need out-of-order delivery of completions. So if we look at how current systems work, it looks something like this. Once the packet is in queued, completion signal is immediately delivered to, the tra to, to transport. Uh, thus, it, it allows the, uh, the transmitter to send more packets, thus overwhelming the shaper. So the way we do it is, we, uh, is, is something like this. We allow the delivery of the completion signal only when the, si the packet has been transmitted from the shaper. Thus, we can control the number of packets for each flow in queued in the, uh, uh, in the shaper. So we benchmarked uh, how this uh, works. And as you can see from this figure, and on the x-axis, we have the number of flows. And on the y-axis, we have the number of packets in the shaper. Without deferred completions, the, uh, the, the shaper is actually overwhelmed with just a few hundred flows, because every flow will send a, a window worth of packets. However, with, delayed, uh, with deferred completions and out-of-order completions, we're able to handle up to 10,000 10, flows easily with the same amount of memory. So our conclusion is for this, for this uh, design component is that we are able to use deferred completion to lower significantly the memory allocated for, uh, for the shaper and improve uh, the, the, the processing overhead uh, associated with that. So to show you how impactful this is, I'll now move to our evaluation. So, we, uh, so to evaluate uh, Carousel, we deployed it within a software NIC, which fits in the stack like, like shown in this figure. It fits after, like after the kernel and before the hardware NIC. We evaluated it on uh, YouTube servers, and we compared it to FQ pacing, because pacing is, is, is important for uh, video uh, content delivery. Each server in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in our setup can handle 50, 50K sessions, and it's actually most of them do. The evaluation metric we looked at was the amount of traffic delivered for, for the work done on the CPU. And, and the, the, this allows us to, bend, to, to, to see the effect of different shapers in terms of their overhead for the same amount of traffic. And to be able to fairly compare two systems, we fix the denominator in this, uh, in this metric. So we compare machines that, that have the same CPU utilization and see how much more or less traffic they can deliver. And the measurements, all of our measurements are, uh, are, are measured within peak hours because that's what those servers are provisioned for. And we evaluated uh, the, the overhead for two, for two uh, uh, setups. The overall CPU utilization, how much CPU for the whole machine is used for shaping. And because our implementation is within the software NIC, we also see how, how, uh, how much impact this shaper is introducing to the software NIC. Is it making it better or worse? So looking at, uh, at overall CPU utilization, unsurprisingly, we, we improved the CPU significantly. To just put it in perspective, reducing 8.2% of overall CPU utilization translates to six cores on a 72-core machine. So in, in, before Carousel, there were six cores dedicated to shaping. Now they're free to, to be leased or, or, or used by other uh, uh, systems. And then we look at the utilization in, uh, in, in the software NIC. 
And surprisingly, Carousel improves performance there too. And the reason for that is uh, it, it actually changes the pattern of packets coming into the software NIC. So the software NIC relies on uh, batch processing of packets coming in. And when you have packet pacing before the software NIC, then batching behavior is actually pretty bad. But when, when you start doing pacing within the software NIC, then packets come in, in, in larger batches, thus improving the overall utilization of the software NIC. So as a summary of, uh, of, of our impact, this figure shows the, uh, the, the GPPS per CPU uh, metric when we, when we started Carousel on five servers. And as you can see, there is immediate improvement in, uh, in, in CPU utilization on, on all five machines. So I don't want to hold you from, uh, from lunch, so I'll conclude very fast. As a conclusion, Carousel actually allows uh, network operators for the first time to shape tens of thousands and up, and we think it, it in, for, in, in, in the future it can allow for millions of uh, uh, configured rates individually, like we can shape millions of flows individually. And we think that, that its advantages is making a strong case for deploying its abstractions in other scenarios, like in, in, in the kernel, in, in, in software stacks, in hardware, and in hypervisors. So thank you. Uh, Matthew Grosvenor from Exablaze. Um, so I, I don't know very much about this data structure that you're using, but it seems to imply a kind of a three-way trade-off, where you have either the granularity of the of the um, pacing uh, traded off with the um, number of buckets and, and, and the sort of scalability of that of that trade-off. Can you kind of quantify how, how close you get, how many different buckets you have, what the granularity is? Because they seem like very important parameters in the space. Yeah, that, that's a very good question. So uh, we actually, in the paper, we explore all these parameters. We look at the rates we can achieve for different parameters. But just as an overview, the, the, the number of the, the time horizon uh, uh, mandates the minimum rate that we can support, and the granularity, the, the time interval represented by each bucket or the number of bucket, buckets within a certain time horizon represents the maximum rate that we can support. And in our experiments, we found that having 8,000 buckets, which is not really much, actually can support all the rates that were needed for, for YouTube traffic. Could, can you quantify that? Be between what and what? Which means that you can support up to I think 15 gigabits per second as the maximum rate, and one megabit per second, or even half a megabit per second of rate. Thank you. Uh, Hassan Kazi from LAMP. So I was wondering uh, if your design in any way um, uh, impacts the ability of operators to realize different scheduling disciplines, like weighted fair, fair sharing or strict priority queuing. Does that get impacted in any way in your shape? So actually, that's a very good question. That's the current problem I'm working on. I'm working on new data structure, a new data structure that's different from a bit from the timing wheel that enables realizing arbitrary scheduling mechanisms in software. Hi, um, this is a very clever work. Thank you. My question is about this tussle between hardware rate limiting versus software rate limiting. Given that the industry is moving towards having NIC cards that are capable of programming, you know, several thousand to millions of rate limiters, I'm curious to hear your thoughts about, you know, why should we pick to have software rate limiters as opposed to hardware rate limiters? So, um, I think one one uh, one reason one one advantage of this work is that it it decouples the al the allocated memory whether it's in software or hardware, from the number of rate limiters that you can support. So I think this work actually is a little bit different from trying to look at uh, software versus hardware. It's actually a new primitive that, that enables you to use the, the, the memory you have, whether it's in hardware or in software, for as many rate limiters that you need. So I don't think that the question of software versus hardware is, 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 is proper for this work, I think. Okay. Uh, do you have any insights? Do you have a preference? Um, like, I, I, I think both have different use cases. Like, at, at like working with Google, like something like TCP BBR, you'll you'll be able to, you need to annotate the packet and something like that. So software is probably necessary because then you run into synchronization problems if you timestamp or something stuff like that. So that's uh, I think like each has its use case.
Okay. So we have time. The next session will start at 2 o'clock. Uh, Laurent is the session chair, so we'll do all the